All right. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Happy New Year to you all. It is indeed my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce a friend, a colleague, and also a role model as a scientist, as a woman in this society, Dr. Natasha Reichel. For those who are plant biologists, I don't need an introduction. For those who are not, just briefly, I'm not going to take much of her time, uh, that she got her PhD in Leningrad. Am I right? Leningrad. And she, after that, she was able to secure a position as an assistant professor in Leningrad. But then later, she decided to immigrate to USA, to United States. And in order to do that, she had to pay a very high price and to become a postdoc again. And she agreed to do that. And she went to Georgia, Athens, Georgia. She worked there on different cell biological questions. And then she was offered a position in PRL, Plant Research Lab in Michigan, where she was offered a professorship, where she started a really um, fascinating and world-class science in cell biological approaches using chemical genomics, and that resulted to her recognition by different agencies and different awards that she has obtained during the last several years. She's been recognized for her achievements by Guggenheim Award, by um, Stefan Hales Award, by Cell Bi American Cell Biology Award, a gold award, it just goes on and on and on. And by 2012, she was recognized as one of the uh, powerful scientists in this country, and she became National Science Academy member. About 15 years ago, she was offered a position at UCR, University of California, Riverside, the sister campus of our university. And when she got there, she started a new uh, institute initially cell biology, then she expanded it to genomic, and now it is called Institute of Integrative Genome Biology. It's really a world-class institute filled with young, powerful people. And she's going to tell us about her most recent achievements in scientific world. It's a pleasure to have you. It's an honor, and please come and take the podium. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you very much for your wonderful uh, introduction and for invitation. I had a wonderful day meeting with students and uh, young professors, and uh, I enjoy my visit very much. And I'm very honored to be invited to give this special lecture and, uh, so, oh, and to share with you our latest data, uh, our work in my lab. And as you can see, I will be talking about chemical biology and endomembrane trafficking. And some of you in the field maybe knows that my lab is known within the endomembrane trafficking field. But I will just explain to you how and why I got involved in the chemical uh, biology. And this happened actually uh, when I moved to UCR. That's where I started that new approaches. So over the years when my postdocs and graduate students worked a lot in uh, endomembrane trafficking, what we have noticed using uh, molecular and genetic approaches that uh, endomembrane system is not just simple dump of something from uh, ER to outside or to the vacuoles. It is an essential system of membranes and it is it, it, intricately connected with the development and signaling. And so many processes, and people at the beginning didn't recognize it, but many processes are involved in, in, in required endomembrane trafficking. However, what happened, and in plants, I'm sure you all in your own research have dealt with something like that, we have a serious problem. Many genes are represented by multi-gene family. 
And uh, whenever you study essential processes, it's a big problem. We are dealing with either with essential genes, so you isolate mut uh, mutant that is lethal and you cannot study it, or you have to work a lot to find conditional mutant, or you're dealing with multifunctional uh, uh, family, and then you need to um, uh, make a lot of double, triple, and quadruple mutants to study. And that was the reason why I decided to try, so, so when, when we deal with vesicular trafficking, we're dealing with very complicated machineries. And here I just very schematically put together, so the Argonels, ERA, Golgi, uh, Trans-Golgi compartment. And then there are usually many, many vesicles. Uh, or endosomal compartment, as we call it, and this is the vacuoles. And these vesicles all have different signature on the surface. And this signature uh, are responsible for their very correct destinations, either to outside or to be targeted from uh, uh, from the plasma membrane to inside. So it's a it's a complicated processes, and every endosome, sorry, has its own function. And many of these uh, proteins, like RAB, small GTPases, or v snares or t snares it's multi-gene families. So the idea was how to figure it out, for me as a cell biologist, how to study these um, uh, processes uh, in an effective way. And one way I decided to try is to, to use what at that time called chemical biology that was only used at that time in Harvard. It was a Harvard and Scripps. It was a two big library, a big chemical um, uh, guys where, uh, who started it. And it was only done at that time in mammalian cells, in, in mammalian cells. Although I have to say that in industry, people use quite often chemical, but it's always, for the most part, to, to, to kill the plant, to, to find the herbicides. In addition, after my experience with the industry, after I got into this chemical biology, I really realized that I don't want to deal with them because they never give you everything. It's just, uh, it just doesn't work for, for academia to, to work openly with industry. So I decided to concentrate on open source of chemicals. And what is the chemical biology? It's use of small molecules to perturb and study and control the cellular and physiolo physiological uh, pro function of proteins. So what, we, what do we want? What is the big picture? <coughs> so we want to have, so this is just, if you look at all these arrows, uh, you could see, so I would like to have for each process a specific chemical that would allow to inhibit this particular process. And we have already have some of them, and I'll come uh, later to, to summarize these this processes altogether. But this is a big question. How to find all these inhibitors, as you see in blue, that would be specifically responsible for particular process? So how does uh, 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 chemical biology works? So normally what we have, we have a gene that is transcribed and translated into normal protein. When we deal with classical genetics, we have mutation and we translate inactive protein and we see abnormal phenotype. And if phenotype is little, you, don't, you cannot le uh, le read anything, uh, learn anything about it. However, chemical genomics uh, allow you to transcribe, the, the gene is transcribed, translated into protein, and then you apply a, a family of chemicals. And if chemical is specific for your protein or for your phenotype, you will see a phenotype when it's incubated with this compound. You can wash it out and you can restore your phenotype. So this is all shows, so you can make a conditional mutant, so to speak. So uh, the so advantages of this approach uh, uh, are that it's address lethality and redundancy, it's rapid, it's reversible, it's tunable, conditional, 
And of course, as we all know in, in our country, it's extremely important because it's translatable, because uh, you cannot do uh, this high throughput uh, study using corn or rice, uh, agronomically important uh, plants, but you can do it in Arabidopsis and then you can translate it into uh, agronomically important, um, agricultural important plants. The biggest challenge in this approach is a target identification. And uh, so today I will show you one of our successes where we really, uh, it was hard work and a lot of luck, I would say. So uh, another uh, slide I just would like to show you just to show how endless opportunity with chemical genomics are. So today, so if we theoretically want to, to, uh, to think about number of possible small molecules, number is here. I obviously cannot even pronounce that number. That is theoretically possible. Today, with all possibility of combinatorial libraries and everything, only this number is available. So it, what I'm telling you, for any, I almost believe, I believe that for any possible phenotype or uh, processes, you can find specific chemical if you look very hard. So also, so my, my idea was that if we have these bioactive molecules, which now with combinatorial libraries, uh, ability to make them very quickly, not one by one as it was several years ago, which is very expensive and time consuming. And uh, uh, our genomics, uh, um, uh, uh, ability to do genomics approaches, uh, mutants and sequence and, and known genomes in Arabidopsis, we had a lot of reagents to really to, to create uh, um, a platform that would allow us to address, uh, to isolate inhibitors of particular functions. The way we do this uh, work is I usually buy and I bought for uh, in Riverside uh, large uh, combinatorial libraries from different sources. So, uh, never mind. And um, yes, so, uh, and then we aliquoted them into, for example, 96 well played, but it depends on your screen. You can use any platform you want. And here we have, um, every chemical is dissolved in DMSO because uh, the DMSO is a very small amount, only it just, uh, you use it to dissolve the chemical. And each well will have agar and, uh, uh, one chemical and a little bit of DMSO. And we place, and all we do it automatically, uh, Arabidopsis seeds in each of them. We germinate those uh, seeds and we look for specific phenotype. So in any screen, what is most important is to find a very simple screen. You don't want to have a hard work because when it's hard work, it's not worth it because we are talking about thousands and thousands of compounds to screen. So let's see you found the phenotype. Next step, you need to find a target because this is the, the really the, the main bottom line. So in the past, and it, the, the, of course with Arabidopsis, the most straightforward uh, way for us to deal with this issue we to do to look for resistant or hypersensitive mutants, and that's what we've done for, and were successful in many uh, approaches. But those who know this field can know for sure that you try to publish somewhere high and they will say to you, well, genetics not good enough. Well, what about to show it biochemically that you could, but we for a long time could not get success with biochemical isolation of target. But today I will show our first example when we were successful in both biochemical and um, and I'm extremely proud of this, this work. So this is just to summarize, in, in s several years we published quite a lot of papers and identified quite uh, several compounds that are used now by many people from my lab and other labs and all my former postdocs have their own labs, including here, um, and study using those chemicals. And so, but when we started this work, uh, so our first chemicals that we have isolated were sortins, 
sortings uh, interrupting traffic into the vacuoles. Uh, then it was chemical gravacin that uh, keeps uh, some membrane proteins at the plasma membrane. And then we concentrated on group of chemicals that we called endocytinins. You can see here different numbers. And today I will tell you the story about one of these endocytinins. And the, usually the way we do uh, screens for these endocytinins, we're using uh, uh, several uh, marker proteins, plasma membrane markers. And we're using uh, PIN2, it's an uh, oxygen uh, reflux carrier, and PIN1 or BRI1, so the membrane proteins. But for us, it doesn't make any difference the function of this protein. For us, it's important that it's a membrane protein and we use it as a model. And one thing I just want to mention for those who are not cell biologists, to just to remind you that normally proteins do not sit a membrane protein just on a plasma membrane. They constantly recycle in so-called integrate and retrograde, retrograde uh, pathways back to plasma membrane. So, but when they do this, they accumulate it in different endosomes. And that's the question, what are the features of this endosome? And to study is just by genetics, it's hard because you can just, by a chance, if you're lucky, you can figure it out. You can stumble upon particular endosomal uh, mutant. But in reality, this is much more uh, targeted approach because we know what we are looking at. So basically the question was to get more of these endocytins. So how did we, okay, oops. So uh, as I mentioned to you, the, the most important thing in this work to find the easiest approach. And uh, I have a long-term collaborator and colleagues in my lab who used to be my postdoc back in Michigan and then came and worked with me and still is working with me in plant research in, in uh, UCR, uh, Dr. Glenn Hicks. And Glenn had a great idea. He said, look, what if we use a pollen tubes, and the pollen tubes uh, grow asymmetrically, they, they really, and vesicular trafficking is essential for their growth, because that's how they grow. And what if we just use, as initial screen, when we have 10,000 of chemicals, these pollens in order to find and narrow down, uh, find the chemicals that will inhibit growth of pollen, and that was the question. It was very effective, so basically we, and we started with tobacco pollen because it's easier to work with compared to Arabidopsis, and then uh, using automated uh, confocal microscope and starting with, I, I believe, uh, close to 90,000 uh, chemicals, we um, uh, decreased the amount of 360 inhibitors and made a sub-library, and many people are using these 360 inhibitors coming from different places to our place and use it for their particular question because it's active compounds. And then these 360 inhibitors were used, um, analyzed with uh, different concentration, da, 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 but main thing, were re-examined, and, and this was brute force, enormously hard working uh, uh, time in the lab, under the confocal microscope using several markers, membrane markers, to see which one is affected by these chemicals. And this was work, uh, so this is just to show you uh, how pollen phenotype, we isolated uh, approximately eight pollen phenotypes, uh, they, they just look differently. This is not important for this particular talk. And then what we did when we isolated this and we narrowed down to 120 chemicals after that um, uh, screen, we have, no, 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 so it was 360 chemicals. And then we, uh, tran uh, we translated the knowledge from uh, uh, pollen to Arabidopsis roots where we had a lot of markers for different uh, endomembrane compartments. So then the work was, you can recognize here, Georgia. Uh, it, this was a work day, night, 24-7, from May till the end of August for four months of five women in my lab. So uh, Georgia and Michelle were from my lab, 
And these two ladies, Stephanie and Mary, Mary Ari, came from uh, Ghent. It was a collaborative project between my lab and lab of Irji Frimmel and Eugenia Rusinova. And they worked day and night, nonstop, looking for different phenotypes, see which chemicals has effect, which chemicals makes, instead of uh, just green, like uh, Pintu would be just green, will make this what we call endocytin in bodies. Okay, so that's, and we, they found 15 phenotypes. At that time, we didn't have any quantification, ability to quantify it, now we know how to do it, but at that time, what they did was they figured out how to cluster those phenotypes. And based on the, those cluster, uh, we, we, we were able to, to decide uh, and which different people in the lab started to concentrate on different chemicals. Today I will tell you the result of work on, of this chemical we called endocytin 2. This endocytin 2 and the work was done, the work which I will tell you was done with a lot of collaboration but the major force behind it and extremely hard working and extremely talented postdoc, Shenhua Zhang, who just now moved a week ago to her own lab in Purdue. So this is, uh, this is in the side, in the very, very simple molecules. And this is uh, uh, Demisop, pollen. This is just to show you how this uh, molecule works uh, uh, when inhibits uh, uh, pollen uh, germination. Okay. So what first uh, she did was she f looked at it. So because we know that it inhibits uh, uh, elongation, our first example of uh, germination of pollen, we first uh, uh, question was to look how it, does it affect um, uh, the seedling Cerebidopsis. And first thing she found that this is Columbia, this is pin to GFP, this is our major marker. It's pin to transform this GFP, and we know that it's kosher localization, everything is it's supposed to be. So she found that is to inhibit root elongation. Here you can see uh, in the presence of ES2, this is, uh, this is controlled, this is experiments. Both Columbia and PIN2 has a shorter root, and it also causes uh, aggregation, uh, or, sorry, cause an ag agrivotropic response. So it's, they stop sensing gravity. So then she spent quite a lot of time trying to find what, uh, and, and she sees under the microscope that they make what we call endocytin two bodies. But she wanted to know what compartment these endocytin two bodies are. And we have a lot of markers in the lab, and she went through enormous amount of markers. It's not TGN, it's not prevacular compartment, it's not ER, da, da, da. But she found that it is uh, co-localized with a uh, compartment we call endosomal compartment that has a, a GTPA is called RS7, which is a late endosomal compartment. And you can see this colocalization here, or colocalization here, so RS7. So this is a little bit to put us uh, uh, orient. So what you try to do before you put a lot of work into uh, going after target, you, you have to orient yourself in the cell and see what part of the uh, pathway you're working with. So then what you notice is that in the side, I mean, is, it, is it a little bit too high there? No, it's okay. You can, that it, it's, um, that in the side, I mean, uh, to reduce localization of PIN2 at the plasma membrane. Here you see control. This is a quantification of this experiment. And this is in the presence of E2. This is zero, and this is uh, after 120 minutes. So uh, at the plasma membrane, there are less of uh, uh, PIN2 in the presence of E2. So then the question is where that PIN2 goes. And she did the, uh, uh, analysis and found that, in fact, it's accumulated in the vacuoles. And uh, in the vacuoles, it's accumulated um, 
for degradation, obviously. So it doesn't go, so as you remember, I told you that normally pin two comes and has to uh, retrograde, go back to plasma membrane. But in the presence of ES2, it goes to the vacuoles for degradation. That was good. And then we ask a question, could it be that it's uh, interfere with exocytosis? And for this, she did experiments with Berfeld DNA. Maybe some of you know the Berfeld DNA, it's a drug, well-known drug that inhibit trafficking within the Golgi. And so the way we do this experiment, so for example, this is BFA body when you treat the, uh, the, the seedlings uh, that uh, have transformed PIN2 GFP, this is Befeldian body, and then this is DME. So when you wash out um, the, the, the BFA but add ES2, what you could see that you uh, still see the, the, um, the, this body present, which tells you that it really is to inhibit exocytosis recycling. And this is a gay quantification of this work. So after all this work, Xinhua was able to position this ES2 here. So basically, from everything that we, we understood, this something, the process that uh, interrupted, that t takes, takes proteins back to the plasma membrane and send them here to, to the pavacular compartment and then from that to the vacuoles. So that was good. After that, when you uh, figured out this type of analysis, then next you have to do uh, structure activity relationship. And what she was able to find after a lot of work and analysis that this iodine is very important for activity. However, this benzoic ring is replaceable. And she found also by doing, and you have to do this analysis all the time, a lot of analogs, those that are better uh, active and those that are, look the same but not active, negative analogs. And what she did this, and this is a remarkable woman, she went to orga organic chemistry lab and working together with the students, learn how to um, mobilize this benzoic ring and add amino group here for both, for active analog and not active analog. And then she was able to do, to take this both active analog and not active analog and add biotin to this. And I, on the next slide, I just would like to show you what absolutely uh, shocked me. I just could not believe when she brought me a data that showed that with these huge biotin molecules that uh, analog, active analog was active in planta. And this is, I, I think it's, it's her wonderful work, but it's a lot of luck, I guarantee to you, it, because it doesn't happen often. So this is to show you how ease to makes this endocyte uh, body, you could see them here. This is uh, uh, active analog without biotin, just with amino uh, uh, um, added to the benzoic ring. This is inactive analog, there is nothing here. But this is, you could see, in the presence of biotin, you still can see in the side two bodies, not as good as here, but you still see it here, and this is a negative control. After this, she uh, uh, conjugated this, these molecules to streptidogen beads, uh, made a, a, a total extract, put it on, on, on the beads, and then eluted it with ease too. And what was eluted, she performed mass spec analysis. And when she per performed that mass spec analysis, and uh, she was able to identify a molecules uh, that uh, allow us to conclude that protein called exo-70 uh, is involved in these processes. So what is exo-70? Exo-70 uh, is a part of the complex, exo uh, complex, which is very, it it's uh, uh, consists of eight different proteins, different sex proteins and two exos, and also has a lot of periphery proteins, mainly GTPases that involved in movement. And what it does, it moves vesicles and tether it to the plasma membrane, uh, and then brings whatever is inside to outside to, to, for exocytosis. So, what, so our 
So we immediately thought, okay, this is probably inhibits this interaction of exon 7 inhibits plasma membrane. So now coming back to redundancy, remember that I said, so exon 7 this type of uh, uh, exocytosis exists in yeast, in mammals, uh, and in plants. In yeast, there are one exo-17. In mammals, there are one exo-17. In plants, there are 23 exo-17. So we have a problem, right? So, so that that's was the challenge that next to figure out what, um, you know, how, how we can sort it all out. So after she found this exo-17, she decided, first of all, to go ahead and see whether she could uh, uh, reproduce this data by uh, uh, affinity purification from the plants using this biotinylated active analog and then active analog and then Western blood analysis. And you can see here that the active analog allow her to isolate, you know, large amount and much smaller, you know, very little of, and this is quantification of this work. This is active analog and this is inactive analog. So it shows that if she can immunoprecipitate exo 70 from the plant. So then, then the started interesting work. So usually you show this, but then reviewers and you yourself, you need to do a lot of more analysis to convince yourself that it's specific, that it's really something that binds to, to, to the target. And there is a not very often used, but in mammalian system it used more often, but not long time ago developed method called DART assay. It's a drug affinity responsive target stability. It's a mouthful. But uh, so what it does, it basically is trying, the idea is that um, proteins uh, could be protected from proteases if they have specific ligand bind to this. Uh, so that is basically the, the, and so Xinhua went ahead and did these experiments using her ES2 and she was, okay, okay, she was lucky again, you can see here, this is, she's using pronase, which is a mixture of different proteases, this is ES2, this is, we're using antibodies against exo 70 that we have, and uh, this is just Kamasi for, for loading control. So. You can see that at one to 300 dilution of pronase, she protects, uh, ES2 protects at the 70 from degradation. And it's uh, at one 100, it's uh, 1,000, it's even more. So that was good. It also was suggestion that, that we are on the right uh, path. Then she went ahead, she found another method. And this method called um, it's called uh, STD, uh, uh, NMR spectroscopy, saturation transfer differences, STD, NMR. And it's, uh, it's um, in biochemist, in chemistry, and biochemistry is considered one of the most effective ways to show specific binding. For this, she overexpressed the protein X70 in E. coli, isolated it, and then use this to, to inject <laughs> into that uh, equipment. And here the idea is if there is a binding between uh, chemical and the target is specific, so the, and it binds and interacts through the different uh, hydrogen molecules, then you see what they call off resonance, resonance, on resonance, but what is important to have to see difference. If we have different spectra, it means that it's specific. So when she uses ES2, she sees this different spectra. When she uses analog, she doesn't have this different spectra. That was also very good because in the in field, uh, this is considered to be extremely uh, important um, uh, step. It was not enough for her. She did another analysis using uh, Microscale thermophoresis assay, which is required fluorescently labeled target and a protein, and uh, the, 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 the molecule and a protein, and increased temperature. And then uh, you could see here that in increased temperature, the, uh, when you add E2, it go, analog, it goes up. However, when you use uh, unrelated analog, there is no, uh, interactions could be seen here. So by three different methods in plus immunoprecipitation, she was able to show that indeed uh, ES2 directly interact with exo 70. 
After that, she decided to go into genetics. So uh, she uh, obtained all possible uh, available mutants from uh, Ohio State Center. And what was interesting that she was able to find out of 23 mutants available, only one allele showed dominant resistant to um, uh, uh, in the uh, in, in the side too. And it was heterozygous. We could not, we, we were able to make homozygous, but homozygous were very small. We've done some work and I'll show you in a second, but you cannot do serious work by chemical work. So a lot of work was done with heads. And so, uh, so she, she was, we, we, we was able to find this only one allele. And so she could not, so she decided to study this allele a little bit more and uh, understand how, why heterozygote still uh, show this resistance. And she decided to look at it at transcriptional level. And by doing uh, RT-PCR, she was able to find a small piece that was present in the head, okay? So then uh, she decided to go ahead and look on the protein level. She ran the, um, uh, Kamasi uh, gel and took what is expected from full length uh, um, uh, 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 the 70 and whatever would be this 25 kilodalton protein and did again um, uh, LCMS and, uh, uh, and then here you could see the fingerprints of what, what she was able to obtain uh, from these experiments and you can see this is a wild type and you see this uh, 25 kilodalton peptide. And when you look at uh, homozygous mutant, and this work was done in homozygous mutant. Um, so she could see this 25 kilodalton uh, fingerprint is present, you see? So, so the bottom line here is that in homozygous mutant, this 25 kilodalton peptide was present and at the beginning, we thought that maybe that's the reason why it was over a large amount of it, and that's where resistance is coming from. Now we know that it's not the case. We are not absolutely sure that, uh, but we have some, some ideas what, what this in terminus uh, does. So, but she went ahead, she took this N-terminal propeptide and transferred it into wild type Arabidopsis, because if that caused resistance, she could make resistant uh, this, this transgenic plants. And indeed, she was able to have, you could see, partial resistance here when she transferred this uh, peptide into that uh, wild type Arabidopsis. So it looked like this uh, seedlings show resistance to ease to both in gravity uh, response and in root lens. Uh, so after this, this approaches and, and work, she went ahead and decided to do some more cell biology. Again, this was done with collaboration with people uh, in Prague. As, as uh, you remember that we started screening by looking at this Arabic, uh, polarity, uh, the, the, the chemical, uh, just a second. Pollen grows polarly, so, and the, the chemicals you would expect could be interfere with polarity. And we know that exocysts, some exocysts uh, localize uh, in, in a polar, polarity uh, manner in, in the cells. And interestingly, what we were able to find that if you look at this, look at here, the E2, this is a control and this is experiments. E2, in, uh, in the presence of E2, um, exo 70 lose polarity in, in, in this area of roots. And the other uh, um, components of that uh, complex, uh, exotis complex, is not affected. So it's very specific for exo, exo, two, exo 70. The other way to look at it again, coming back to pollen, that it, if this is true, it should also interfere with uh, root, root hair growth because it's kind of similar to pollen growth. And here you see control, this is a bleaching experiment. So she 
takes uh, the, the root hair, then she bleaches it. You don't see uh, the, the uh, pin tool at the plasma membrane. And in control, in 150 seconds, it's appeared back. But in the presence uh, of uh, endocytin, you see it's 150 seconds, it's still not there. So uh, ease to affect plasma membrane docking efficiency of, of the exo 70 in root hair. So all these experiments show that it, in truth, it exo 70 uh, interfere with the polarity, interfere with the plasma membrane trafficking and uh, plasma membrane localization. So after she'd done all this work, she, we decided to say, look, because it's also exosis present in mammalian cells, what, let's look at what kind of effect it has in mammalian cells, maybe we can see. And we collaborated with a group in Philadelphia, in University of Philadelphia, who works on uh, exocytosis of transferrin. It's their, their marker. And this is experiments were done in HeLa cells. This is DMSO in 90 minutes, 30 minutes, 90 minutes, it's already secreted. But in the presence of ES2, you can see even in 90 minutes, it still stays in the cell. So it looks like ES2 is potent in HeLa cells as well. So then we went ahead and decided to look in, um, in another HeLa cells uh, in more details in cells itself. This was just uh, uh, tissue culture, but this was in more, more uh, in, in fibro fibroblasts, I believe. No, it was in HeLa cells too, but under the microscope already, more precisely with higher magnification. And you can see here that, okay, this is DMSO, but this is in the presence of ES2, it stays inside. In the presence of ES2, it, uh, it, it, it is red, red exo 70. So then what Xunhua does, she takes this rat at the 70, express it in E. coli, and ask a question if she would, will do this STD experiments, whether it has specific interaction. And you can see, remember I told you about this off resonance, on resonance. It's less, less binding than in plants, but it's still specific. And when she uses inactive, uh, it, there is no difference spectra. So E2 interacts with red exo 70. Then she decided to look for human exo 70. And the reason why she decided to look with human exo 70 because there is a work that uh, has been published uh, many times that uh, uh, in humans, this exocytosis complex implicated in several cancers and diabetes. In, because in the case when it's involved in the pathway tra trafficking of those components through the, in the membrane trafficking system. And sure enough, she was able to, this is DMSO, and this is isoform 5, this is two controlled uh, uh, DMSO and DMSO, and this is in the presence of ES2, you could see that it stays inside. So this is very exciting. And we decided, so we were very perplexed because when you look at amino acid, homology, it's only 20, 25% between uh, mammalian and uh, plant uh, exo 70. So we could not figure it out how this chemical would be able to, to see it. So believe it or not, what this woman does, woman mean, meaning um, uh, Shunhua, she go ahead and she crystallize plant exo 70. Human exo 70 was crystallized. She was able to crystallize it at a high resolution, 3.1, um, uh, and, and sperm. and here it's her threading of, of uh, plant subunits, and then she was able to overlap them together. And what is interesting, she was able to find that when you look at the secondary structure, they, they overlap. So it's in spite of very different amino acid composition, secondary structures are very similar. Well, she didn't stop just on that. She decided to find a binding pocket for, for this, uh, for E2 on exo 70. And she did it by using uh, computational analysis and work with a chemist, a computational chemist who, who is very good at some, things like that. And after a lot of analysis, found a, a pocket, not at the N terminus, but at C terminus. And the pocket was uh, very, very tight and she was able to mutate a few amino acids that 
uh, allow her to address the question where it binds and how it binds. Uh, but it's interesting that she could not do it ex uh, extensively because some amino acids are so essential that protein disappears, so it's not stable. But she was able to do uh, mutation in uh, leucine 596 and isoleucine 613, and uh, she was able to find, you see this STD analysis, this is just uh, control, and this is in the presence of these mutants. You could see that STD is much lower, and she even did some qu quantitative, okay, yeah, uh, you could see quantitative analysis is much lower in the presence of um, mutants when, when she's done this mutational analysis. So uh, when, she, when she does uh, analysis of, uh, uh, amino acid analysis of red yeast and plant uh, C terminus, she sees some uh, uh, conserved packets. Again, she cannot mutate all of them because protein uh, gets out of solution, but it's obvious that those that she mutated are very essential for, uh, and they're conserved, evolutionary conserved. So basically what she was able to, to, to find, so we have that, we have vesicles that uh, interact with that uh, complex, uh, exosis complex, uh, exos 70 is important component is to most likely bind here, exos 70, and so it's, it, and it does not then allow protein to go outside or the vesicle to go outside. Vesicle carga moves to the vacuoles, and, but it's a lot of other components involved. And what N-terminus actually plays a role, and now we have some evidence to this, interacting with other components of the subunit. So it's a very complicated machinery that she is going to unravel in, the, in her own lab in um, Purdue. But uh, I think it was very uh, rewarding to me that f finally we were able to show genetically and biochemically uh, to identify the target and prove that it is a target. So we basically found this E2, uh, that it is a small molecule that inhibit in, uh, exocytosis in both plants, mem and mammalian cells. It directly interact with both plant and mammalian exo 70 proteins. E2 inhibits exo 70 localization to the plasma membrane. A mutant expressing truncated exo 70 protein has resistance to E2. This conservation of in 3D structure explains why E2 can target exo 70 proteins to both proteins and mammalian cells. So we also have done now conditional genetic screens for E2 hypersensitive and resistant mutants, and it will help us to understand the trafficking and signaling pathway related to exocytosis process. And in general, I believe that small molecules are useful uh, tools to study endomembrane trafficking and many other pathways. Finally, I would like to thank people who've done it. So it uh, was a lot of collaborators, wonderful collaborators, but I have to give credit to this woman, Shunhua Zhang. It was, it was her baby. She did it. Most everything, it was with it, either her initiative or her doing it. So uh, I, I have other people working on different projects, uh, and they also participated a little bit, help here, help there, but Basically, it's, it's Shenhua. And I, as I said, we have a lot of <coughs> collaborators, and we are extremely grateful. This paper just was published a, a week or two weeks ago <coughs> in, in PNAS. And actually, somebody wrote a very nice co commentary, which I was surprised to see. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank well, I'm, I'll be happy to answer the questions. What is the current hypothesis for the nature of the dominant resistance of the N-terminal fragment? Oh, in this particular case, well, it, it could be s s different. One, we thought that maybe it's just so much of this N-terminus accumulated, right? Because we overexpress it, for example, in wild, that it could overcome uh, the uh, effect of, of uh, ES2 uh, in, in inhibition of, 
But honestly, right now, we, we really don't understand exactly what it does. It's also possible that uh, is to is uh, is uh, um, not a, a single molecule. There are two together. So so and uh, when we inhibit, we, it's not inhibit everything. So there is something is still there. But you you have to do much more work now with the uh, um, NMR and uh, more more mutations for her to, to really to dissect this. This is a question we, we really, really don't, cannot absolutely explain. We, for the, at the beginning, we thought that it's just N-terminus bind to it, and that was clear. And when we add too much of N-terminus, that's how it was working. But then we figured out that it's C-terminus, so it's much more complicated. But what she's done now, a preliminary work, uh, using this N-terminus, she was trying to pull down what she can pull down, and she pulled down exa 84. So it means that it's other complicated interactions there, so which is, will be, you know, good grant for her or something. Yeah, come on. So the, is it possible that the binding of ES2 stabilizes the complex so that it sucks up the complex away from property? So it gets our ES2? So the ES2 points to exosomity so that all the complex is now still in that well, uh, I don't think that it stays because uh, we find the cargo then in the vacuoles, right? So it's, uh, it's moves it, it somehow, it, it cannot be completely stabilizing. It's just, it's, it moves uh, the cargo from the, uh, that's supposed to be moved out, we found in the vacuoles. We did not look for as a 70 in, in the vacuoles, so. Is it, uh, um, is it possible it also affects the trafficking for other membrane receptors in addition to the What are other chemicals? No, like the same one, the ES2, for example. <coughs> but does it affect any other trafficking? Like uh, BRI1, uh, or is it very specific? BRI1, Bri yes, uh, OX1, PIN2, yes, or many membrane proteins, but not PGPs, for example but many membrane proteins. Looks like all these receptors, uh, the, the, when they go back using that, that pathway. But we don't really know what, in, in every cells, whether all these exercise complexes are the same, because we have different cell multigen families, right? And she now started to dissect, try right, to ask whether it is cell type specificity with the, between different uh, uh, exo 70s and plants and how many of them will be effective with AS2 or how many not. And also she's trying to make a better AS2 because <clears throat> like with all drugs, you can make it <coughs> better, more uh, tight binder. <coughs> They, those structures resemble that of some, 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 sorry, some secondary metabolites of, such as flavonoids. So is it, is it known whether or not these uh, flavonoids or other secondary metabolites actually have similar impacts on endocytes or they just as endocytes do? Um, I don't think that anybody looked at it. And uh, uh, we did a lot of work to ask a question how stable endocytin 2 is inside. Maybe it's cleaved, da, da, da. We, we know not. It's, it's very stable. It was done a lot of work. And we use different known uh, that you can buy uh, uh, kind of flavonoids, whatever, just to see whether we can get the, uh, the same effect. And we don't. But we did not do it exhaustively. You see? So it could be that. Uh, Synthetic, so, sorry, people who work with natural compound can find some and decide to in, inside this uh, cell, but I, I don't know that we could not find, we, could, we didn't look for that extensively. Any other? So there are many exo 70 isoforms in the rabbit offices. 23. 23, so this is specific just for the two isoforms. Mm, no, I think so. She she look she didn't look ex exhaustively yet. We we think it is it is not specific only for this, but it's not 
doesn't bind across the board. So there is some specificity there, but she don't, we don't know it yet. She has to look into it. Well, because it binds to mammalian, it should be quite uh, a lot of uh, over overlap, but we know that one subunit for sure it doesn't bind. That she looked at. Yes? Um, I have a question. Does this ES2 interact with the yeast from the lab? We didn't look yet. We didn't look at mammalian. Function and uh, transkinium functional conservation. With that, let's thank Natasha for this fascinating talk. And uh, see you forward with coming to dinner.